Now it's time to look at China's fintech explosion. And that is not just the title of today's webinar, it's the title of a wonderful book by one of our speakers, Professor Sarah Xu. Uh, Professor Xu has really done a wonderful job together with her co-author in this book, and I heartily recommend it. She'll be giving you a broad overview of some of the contents here in just a moment. She uh, is extremely qualified to be talking about this subject. Now, you and I, uh, you may know about China's fintech explosion primarily through the use of digital payments, through Alipay, WeChat Pay, things like that. And you obviously know that China's economy is huge and that three of the largest banks in the world are Chinese banks. But you may be surprised to learn that these giant banks are not the leaders in this fintech revolution. They are not the pioneers. The pioneers are in the private sector. The pioneers have been in the tech sector. And the need is enormous. China is, uh, you know, this sprawling country. Its economy has been growing, but a lot of Chinese are underserved by the financial system. They don't have easy ways to bank. They don't have convenient means to consume. And what else? There's a lot of other things that they might want to do to invest and to do other things. This FinTech uh, explosion, this revolution, is addressing some of those things. Now today we have with us, uh, as I've already mentioned, Professor Sarah Xu, the author of FinTech Explosion, China's FinTech Explosion, available from the Columbia Business School. So you can get this uh, you know, on Amazon, at the Business School website and other places. There's a link in the chat space for that. She earned a PhD in, in economics and for a number of years taught economics at State University New York, New Paltz. She's written not just academic books such as this one, she's also written about informal finance, something quite related to this. Uh, informal finance is something that people had to turn to because they didn't have standard means of borrowing. She's also written on shadow banking. These books are really important. But she's not just written for academics. She's been involved in public discussion. She's written for The Diplomat, for Forbes. She's been on television a number of times. And she is with us today. She'll be the first of our two speakers. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Wan Li Min, and Dr. Min is an extraordinary, an extraordinary person. He uh, has been on the ground in China's technological revolution. He took a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. He worked for IBM in a couple locations, including at the Watson Research Center. Then he went to Google, where he may have contributed to that, that small company's development, before moving to Alibaba where he served as chief data scientist for their cloud operation. Since then, he's moved into venture capital and is helping to build other tech companies. His specialty has been artificial intelligence. And one of the companies that his uh, North Summit Capital is, has invested in is Aerodyne, a company that's trying to ma match drone and other technologies to companies that need to take care of infrastructure. His venture capital firm aims to bring the newest of tech, artificial intelligence, to more traditional industries. This is really vital stuff. Now, you and I are going to be listening to, to Dr. Min in just a minute, but China's government has been listening to him for some time. He is among the advisors to the Chinese government on science and tech. But without further ado, let's turn, uh, turn things over to Professor Xu. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah Xu. Today, Dr. Wan Li Min and I are going to talk about China's fintech industry. This is a sector that both he and I consider to be a critical part of China's financial industry development. The reason for this is that many people are not otherwise able to obtain financing. Therefore, China's fintech industry has helped to fill that gap. 
So let's get started. There are several reasons for fintech's popularity in China. The first is that there are insufficient loans provided for small and medium-sized enterprises and individuals. The reason for this is that state-owned banks tend to lend to larger enterprises, and that smaller entities are often left out. This means that they usually have to turn to the curb market, or to money lenders, or places that are not as、uh, low interest as turning to a bank. The second reason for fintech's popularity in China is that there is low credit card penetration. People have not caught on to using credit cards as much, at least not in the physical form. For China, many people have obtained their first credit card by getting digital credit cards, and as a result, they have easy access to credit. The third reason for fintech's popularity in China is that there is a lack of profitable financial investment. This means that people have may have extra money that they want to invest. But do not have a proper channel in which to invest it. In other words, they are not able to have a return on their funds that is greater than a savings interest rate. So many of them have turned to fintech in order to satisfy this demand. China has experienced several stages of growth in its fintech sector. There's the early growth stage pre-2013, the diversification stage from 2013 to 2016, and the legitimization stage from 2017 to the present. In the early growth stage, internet-based finance was in its very beginning stages of development. This arose in the 2000s with the advent of companies like Ant Financial or Alipay and PPDI Group. Then there was a massive upward growth as e-commerce began to really hit the market around 2010. Using the internet to pay for goods and services became increasingly popular. Later on, the diversification stage was ushered in in 2013, and this lasted through 2016. Some regulation was implemented during this period. However, at this time we saw an increase in the defaults of peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. So, just as there was the rise of an increasing number of types of sub-industries, there was also the failure of many firms within these new industries. The last stage of China's、uh, fintech industry growth began in 2017, and this brought China to a new level of maturity. During this period, the fintech sector was rocked with a new set of regulations imposed, particularly on the peer-to-peer -peer lending sector. This forced many firms into compliance and led to the legitimization of many fintech firms. China's fintech sector has been disrupted by five major technologies. These include artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud computing, big data, and 5G. Artificial intelligence has changed the way that financial firms think about customer acquisition and retention, as well as risk management. Application of AI to China's financial field includes intelligent customer service, smart investment, intelligent risk control, intelligent investment research, and intelligent marketing. Blockchain has helped reduce the need for intermediaries. Although it's still in its nascent stages, it's an up-and-coming technology. Cloud computing has made fintech businesses lighter and more easily adaptable to different business scales. It allows businesses to use third-party technology to scale up, thereby reducing the cost of their technology. Big data is comprised of large data sets that can be analyzed to reveal different patterns and associations. And finally, 5G has greatly improved all of these technologies and boosted connectivity speeds for all fintech firms. Let's turn to talking about the subsectors of China's fintech industry. First and foremost, we'll talk about digital payments, which were some of the first types of firms to enter the fintech industry in China. Alipay and WeChat Pay comprise about 92% of China's market share in this sector. However, did you know that there are about 247 third-party payment platforms? All of these compete heavily for China's consumers. 
As China's e-commerce sector has grown, so has the use of online payments. With the use of Alibaba and JD.com and other large websites, consumers are choosing to pay online more and more using digital payments. Consumers also use their digital wallets offline. For example, many Chinese residents pay for taxis by using offline WeChat Pay or Alipay payments. Next, we turn to China's peer-to-peer -peer lending sector. As you can see from this graph, the number of P2P lending platforms first rose dramatically through 2015 and then declined dramatically through 2019. The attraction at first was very clear. Both borrowers and lenders found that peer-to-peer -peer lending was very appealing. Borrowers were attracted to these platforms' cost-effective pricing, flexible repayment channels, and financing discounts, whereas lenders and investors were attracted to the associated registration rewards, cash back for credit-based purchases, and competitive returns. However, these platforms tended to be excessively risky with a lot of fraud and high risk involved. Therefore, you can see from the decline that as regulators crack down upon this sector, the number of P2P lending platforms that could survive dramatically dropped. Next, let's talk about China's online investment and insure tech subsector. There are many different firms competing in this sector. One of the first was Ant Financial. Ant Financial introduced Yue Bao as a way for customers to invest leftover funds. This has become the world's largest money market fund. Yue Bao places funds in bank deposits, short-term investments, policy bank bonds, company bonds, and interbank deposits. This has gleaned a number of competitors. China Merchants Bank introduced a similar fund called Yi Bao. There are other funds as well in this area that are up and coming. In addition to that, there are several different types of online only insurance companies that provide a variety of types of innovative insurance. One of these is Jong'an Insurance, which provides a variety of types of insurance, including travel insurance for ctrip.com and tk.cn, a sub subsidiary of Taikong Insurance. Traditional banks have found themselves forced to compete with the fintech industry. Li Yunzhu, vice president of ICBC, stated, Today's new era of financial technology has produced more efficiency, more quality, more valuable new finance. It also injected a lot of vitality into the innovation of commercial banks. Many commercial banks have found that they needed to introduce new types of technology in order to compete for customers. For example, the Agricultural Bank of China introduced facial recognition to verify the identities of its customers. ABC started this practice in 2013, and the process takes less than a second to complete. China Merchants Bank also uses biometrics in order to verify its customers' identities. ICBC introduced an internet-based finance development strategy in 2015. It began cooperation with JD.com in 2017 and now boasts the EICBC business line. In addition, China Merchants Bank was one of the earliest internet finance companies in the Chinese banking circle and became the early leader of internet finance business. Finally, let's talk about China's digital currency scene. China cracked down on cryptocurrencies, starting with its cryptocurrency exchanges. China also banned ICOs or initial coin offerings as well. The reason for this is that China was concerned that cryptocurrency exchanges and ICOs were enabling fraudulent funding. However, China has come out on the side in favor of sovereign digital currency. China is currently in the trial stages of introducing its own sovereign digital currency that will mimic cash currency. I've provided you with a very brief overview of China's fintech industry. 
Now we're going to turn to Dr. Wan Li Min, who will talk about China's fintech landscape today. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for the for the wonderful presentation, and、uh, good afternoon, everybody, and online. So. In my presentation, I'm going to share several interesting observations rather than offering a comprehensive summary of the fintech、uh, in industry in China. Okay, in particular, I I coin the words fintech for good to accelerate financial inclusion because I see personally in the past decade in China the financial service industry the inclusiveness increase a lot. Really, a lot of people just I echo Sarah's.、Uh, Um, Sarah's point: A lot of people a decade ago didn't really have access to financial services in China. They didn't even have a plastic credit card. By the Y two K, credit card was pretty scarce in China mainland. And today, pretty much a lot of the digital digital citizens they have a digital credit card. So the financial services, the fintech industry, has been booming. Aggressively, okay, expo exponentially in China, okay, but the financial inclusion is important because if we look at what happens beneath the 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 financial fintech revolution, essentially it's the fourth industrial revolution. There are three categorically different flow, but concurrently happening. One is the business flow, another is the capital flow, and the third is really the data flow. So essentially, all of the capital movement will leave a digital footmark, a digital footprint. So if you convert that as a data and a data flow, and then essentially you can reconstruct the entire business process from the pure data log in the in the system. So this actually give us a approach to leverage on AI, big data. And and also cloud computing, just as Sarah、uh, mentioned about, okay, to decompose, to understand, to analyze, and to forecast the business operations, the interactions between the seller,、uh, the sellers and the buyers, the lenders and the、uh, the borrowers, and also all the in, intermediate intermediaries, okay, all of the activities inside of the bank. More importantly, online and offline. Because the bank now is not the traditional brick and mortar, a physical branch office per se. Now it's pretty much everywhere in the digital world. As long as you got this mobile app, you got this website, you can do the open banking. So this fourth industrial revolution categorically redefine how we analyze the cash flow and how we. Leverage on the real-time computing, the AI to discover to discover the un unmitted, unmatched demand from the bor borrowers and the buyers. So essentially, we can provide a better service, either like the mentioned the supply, the seller solution, and the borrowers, the buyers solution, or even some convergence of the buyer and the supplier solution with a new business model. In this is a diagram on this page, the left,、uh, the right hand side. So essentially, we see that the fintech innovation can go beyond fintech, can nurture a new business model transformation, and in the back end, we see that on the consumer side, essentially as this book. As this book title suggested, so consumers are getting used to do banking anywhere, but never at a bank. So, what does that mean? So, essentially, ask yourself how many times you make a trip to a local local bank office in a town, and pretty much you are doing this banking online on mobile app. Okay, so the physical trip to the local office is pretty scarce. So this become pervasive. This is a trend, irreversible. And if the bank failed to notice this and keep pace with the change, and they will be basically left behind the game. So having all this big trend, and we see that now everything related to banking or financial services is remote and instant. Remote means that you do not have to go physically to the counter to do the clerk to to do the business with the clerk. Okay, but also in instant that means people cannot wait. There shouldn't be a queue in the waiting line, like 
20 years ago or 30 years ago, you went to the branch office and there's a long waiting line. Okay, the queue is like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And today the queue should be zero. Why? Because it's 24 seven online on the mobile, mobile app, or remote and the instant. And we have to have the right tech in order to support this remote and the instant and the right business model. So essentially, the banking industry has to open access to the side tech, the high tech, the scientific, the science and the tech services. For example, like the left hand side, this diagram suggested a different different players like retailers, for example, and the insurers, the fund managers, okay, the they use open API to access to access all this backend data and massage the data and convert that to actionable insights and provide services to the end consumers. So in this diagram, what's important is the due A, I call this due A, the APP, the app, and the API. The app is really the interface between the consumers. So essentially, people do the open banking, do your e-banking on the iPhone or the Android phone, okay, with a mobile app. In the back end, all of the data flow, the data query and data exchange, the data massage, the actionable insights has to be integrated in real time across different system through API. And this requires a very powerful platform as a service, PaaS, platform pass, platform as a service. Like Sarah just mentioned, like the P2P lending for example, so that P2P really should have uh, another P in the middle. It's peer to platform, platform to peer. So, and the platform supposed to provide the risk over, uh, the risk control measures, the risk assessment, and also the credit limits, all these kind of uh, services, okay, as a traditional banking will do, a traditional lender will do. But the problem is leverage on new data source including their shopping behavior on the e-commerce and uh, on the e-commerce websites and also the personal income, for example, okay, as augmented uh, information together, okay. So this due A is quite important, the app, uh, mobile app and also the API. So having that, and also, also we see that the open banking is not only the demand from the Chinese consumers, rather it's a global, a global demand. As we global trend, as we already, uh, we already seen that the open banking actually originated, originated from UK. And like they also had uh, quite a few unicorns okay, in this domain. Okay. And quickly, quickly spread across the globe. And people essentially realize that the open access of course, with the prerequisite condition of pre, uh, confidentiality and also the privacy of this uh, data security is okay, protection in place. And then the open access is inevitable. So essentially in the past one decade, the open banking becomes everywhere. And also with the open banking, with all this data API, the API and the mobile app and the AI together. So the services essentially, it, come, it, it becomes, unprecedented uh, convenience in the sense that, for example, the insurance underwriting and use the AI, okay? And they can come up with all this premium pricing, like the, even the actual, actuarial science, okay? They can leverage on AI to do certain risk factor de decomposition and discover, okay? And also for the customer services. In the old days, in the 90s, when you make a 1-800 call to the Citibank or to a Chase or Bank of America, very often you have to wait in the queue, okay, wait somebody for somebody to answer your questions, to answer the call, okay. And sometimes they also ask for your approval to, to be recorded. And today, you don't have to wait, why? Well, because that's a robot, that's an AI-labeled, AI-labeled customer service representative, CSR, waiting for, waiting for your business. So essentially, from the customer waiting, now becomes the CSR, the robot, robot, robot CSR are waiting for you. So this is a totally different business flow now. In the old days, it's a channel, it's a big lender, the big bank centric, and today it's a customer, consumer centric. And in China, essentially, if you want to do any business, you basically you have to satisfy or pass 
the sixth test from regulatory, the tenant, you need the right tenants, you need the right management team, you need the right tech. And also you have to consider diverse, uh, diversity and the sustainability. Okay, what does that mean? Essentially, for example, if you look at the diversity and also sustainability, the blockchain, okay, so it's, uh, it's grow, growing very fast in China. Uh, two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, on June 25th, 2018, um, the Alipay, which is, a, which is a subsidiary of Ant Group, okay, associated with Alibaba Group, uh, and Alipay made a successful cross-border uh, remittance service in a couple of seconds with a blockchain, okay. And a customer from Hong Kong made the, uh, sent the money to her family in Philippines in a couple of seconds. This cross-border remittance service, okay, was supported by the blockchain and almost concurrent uh, to that time, um, the world's first online bank opened in Shanghai, China Construction Bank. So this essentially shows how radical it is and something beyond the imagination in the past now becomes reality with the help of AI, with the AI penetration in very specific use case scenario in the financial service industry. So there's, there's no waiting, essentially. Either waiting in, the, uh, in front of the counter or either waiting, um, waiting in the black box for the money to be received by your family in another country. And now only a couple, couple of seconds and you know the answer and they got this cash, okay. And an interesting comparison about the FinTech landscape between China and the rest of the world. And I use this diagram, uh, this, this table, to illustrate the interesting uh, difference, okay. So first of all, in China, all of the big name of the FinTech, like the Ant Financial, the WeChat Pay, or the Ping An Bank, or the JD Finance, they originated from a big conglomerate. And we all know that Ant Financial, the Ant Group, Alipay, has deep relationship with Alibaba Group. And Alibaba, we all know it has a very strong e-commerce platform. And WeChat Pay related to Tencent. And we all know Tencent has a very strong business in social networking and mobile gaming and gaming, okay. And Ping An by itself, okay, obviously, uh, is, a, is a financial giant, okay. And JD, very similar to, JD is very similar to Alibaba, okay. So essentially you see all these big, uh, big giants, the originally, in particular, Ant Financials, WeChat and JD, originally they are in the tech sector, in the e-commerce platform, the domain, and they become big enough and they realize that their customer needs the financial services, needs the payment. So they branch out, they expand it to cover, to introduce the innovative solutions to the sellers and the buyers, especially with the micro loan, okay? Very, very little, not too much, because they do not have too much credit record, a credit report. So anyway, this is how in China, these big fintech giants, okay, grew out of nothing. Actually, they grew out of these big giants, the big giants in another domain, okay, in e-commerce. On the, on the other hand, if we look at it in the Europe and the US, and we have PayPal, and we have Landing Club, for example, okay, and each by itself is big. And they grow out of this specific niche, uh, specific subsectors like the payment sector, the financing or insurance or banking, for example. Okay, and not many of them, the new fintechs, has the coverage of every subsector like payments, financing, or uh, like the and financial or WeChat has. So this essentially shows that a totally different landscape. In China, it's a big giant, the winners take all. So they covers all of the subsectors related to financial services. Why? Because they are, because they are, they are, they are group, I mean the Alibaba, the Tencent are big enough. And their users' consumer base is so huge. Their financial service needs are pretty comprehensive. So they have the luxury to address the same group of people from the same platform. 
On the other hand, in the in the Europe Europe and the US, because it's kind of fragmented or siloed, so the payment industry, the wealth, the, the payment payment sectors, and the wealth management, the finance, and the insurance, okay, pretty much are separated. So the integration or alliance is hard to form. So essentially, this give, this give us a totally two different competitive landscape, and this also shows that in China, if you want to enter into this market and to fight for the opportunity for invest as an investors or as a players as a players as a lender to lend, to do a loan to the borrowers, and you have to notice that you have competing against against the big giants like the Ant Financial, the WeChat, and the Ping and the J, and the JD. So the competition is intense. It's going to be intensified, intensified okay, over the time. So what's the strategy? And how would you go, going to compete in this fast growing market okay, of 1.4 billion people? I think the opportunity lies in this, right in the middle, right here, the SS, SME segment. And um, as Sarah just mentioned that in China, the SS, uh, SME, the small and the media enterprise, they actually had a very hard time to get a reasonable co at a reasonable cost to get a good financing. The cap their capital, their capital structure is quite quite thin. Okay, quite slim. So, how are we going to address their demand? So they need to borrow money. They need financing. And how are we going to do that? And like 20 years ago, when Alibaba started the e-commerce, the show that today we know the journey of Alibaba Group, we know that if we focus on SME and the small and the medium sellers, okay, and we can do a good business. Why? Because if you provide a platform as a service and engage the sellers and the buyers together uh, on the same platform, and then the platform will accumulate all of the service information and then provide the insights and the actionable insights and then offer data-driven real-time on-demand services from the shopping, from the payment to the financial services. And then likewise, we apply the same, the same logic to the SME, the small and the media enterprise. Now, if today we have, enter, we have a platform to serve the SME, in particular, their financing need, their transactions, we follow all this data flow and we form a credit, a credit score or credit report of the SME with a reasonable accuracy and with the good, uh, good algorithms and the cloud computing techniques. And it's possible to replicate the success of Alibaba Group in the e-commerce for, for consumer domain, okay? And that means the SME lending, SME financing in China is an uh, unexplored territory. And the good news is the regular regulations in China is open, opening up to the foreign investors, the foreign investments. And so this SME, Financing obviously is a is a place to to first try and, and rather than just do a head on competition against the big giants okay in the consumer lending, consumer financings. So this probably is what I mean by the China is different, okay. Is opening up that even though the competition is going to intensify, but the opportunity window is big with the SME part. Okay, with that, so I will wrap up my, my sharing uh, and back to you, Clay. You both emphasized inclusion, that one of the m most important things that f this FinTech uh, revolution has done is it's brought hundreds of millions of underbanked or unbanked people into a financial system and has made it easier for them to buy to sell, to save, to invest, to do these different kinds of things from small merchants, and we're talking micro merchants, to everyday consumption, that sort of thing. This question of inclusion. Now, uh, you know, a lifetime ago when I was living in the Chinese countryside, we had the credit union, we also had the Agricultural Bank of China. These, the, the ABC had, had branches everywhere. Every township had one of these things. Why, please? Why 
weren't they the ones that made this happen? Why was it uh, the tech giants that brought about this revolution that now you've got China Construction Bank and ICBC and others joining in? What was it that was necessary here? And Sarah, why don't you go ahead and go first? Um, so I think that the um, state-owned banks, so China is dominated by several large state-owned banks that um, provide about 60% of the loans and um, a lot of, uh, control a lot of the deposits. And they are occupied with uh, lending for policy um, to fulfill government policy, so lending to state-owned enterprises and to uh, larger firms in order to uh, meet the needs of the government and also to meet the needs of these larger firms. And it's quite hard for them to oftentimes find the space to lend to smaller firms as well as individuals. And for a long time, the government has been pushing for the state-owned banks to lend to small and medium-sized enterprises and individuals, but they didn't have the capability to control for risk. And um, this was something that uh, required a lot of innovation, that state-owned banks simply didn't have the time to do the research and development for, and that companies like um, subsidiaries of Alibaba and um, JD and Tencent, as Wanley mentioned, actually were able to carry that out. They had data, they were able to provide credit scores um, for their customers, and, and they were also able to do the R&D to provide artificial intelligence and different types of risk modeling that was really necessary to provide um, these smaller entities with uh, loans and access to investments. Now, thank, thank you. Wan Lee, did you want to respond to that? You, you emphasized FinTech for, you know, for good, this inclusion model. Yes, yes. I, I guess Sarah explained perfectly. So what happened, you know, the technical uh, bottleneck at that time. Uh, so um, I, I also at uh, another point per perspective. In fact, the big tech giants, the reason they actually do did this uh, innovative solution, the financial services, okay, starting from Alibaba and also Tencent, because they have the mindset, the mindset of serving people. Yeah. serving customer. But in the old days, when I was a kid in the countryside of China, I still remember borrowing money from the bank or credit union. It's so hard because the credit union considers they are God. They, they had the privilege of lending money to the borrowers. So they are not considering they are serving people. So with that mindset in place, I don't think they have any motivation for innovation. Why? Because it takes themselves as a god. So I think, I think so. The internet giants like Alibaba Group, like the Ant Financials, the JD and the Tencent, from day one, they know how important it is to serve their customer. In this case, it's a user. And by user, it doesn't matter is uh, old people or young people, is a male or female, or is a PhD student, or it's just like a high school student. As not as a consumer, it's a user ID, and they will treat them equally. So I think this mindset categorically differentiates the two approaches, and also explain why only the tech giants started the fintech innovation in China. Okay. No, I I heartily agree, and I really appreciate uh, the insight from the two of you on this. Uh, you know, we know, for example, that Jack Ma, uh, the head of Alibaba pushed customer first, customer first, you know, that, that fixation on meeting those particular needs. Whereas, as, as Sarah pointed out, the banks are serving policy functions. They are meeting, uh, you know, from top down those kinds of directives, whereas the Alibaba's 10 cents of the world, they're very much focused on this bottom up and seeing opportunity seeing an, you know, an opportunity, and then coming in with the technological solutions. Uh, so it's, it's really quite impressive. And one of the things that's striking in reading Sarah's book and in listening to the two of you, uh, nobody said, well, it was in the 10th five-year plan that China said, we're going to 
have all of this fintech revolution, right? And so it didn't come out of state planning. At the same time, this fintech revolution is meeting a very important state need, right? The state has planned to move the economy away from you know, being predominantly industrial, manufacturing, and into services and having a consumption-driven economy. Could the two of you say something about the role of fintech in taking China's economy to another stage that can be sustainable? That's a macroeconomic question. So um, I actually have a slide about um, about consumption. If I can, can you see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and so this is a um, diagram of China's credit going to consumption, and um, the banks have been gearing some of their loans to consumers, but this also includes fintech firms. And you can see the huge drive towards consumption after 2013, especially after 2016, it dramatically takes off. And um, the fintech companies play a big role in that by providing those credit risk models for consumers um, in order to allow them to get the loans. And so they have filled a gap that simply wasn't there before. Um, and uh, Sorry. <laughs> and so that allows them to uh, be able to serve this segment. Manli, you want to talk about it as well? Uh, yes. Um, I, I guess um, so. It's super important to make sure that, uh, I mean, from the sustainability perspective, uh, the economy perspective, the traditional industry, the in, in particular SME in the manufacturing, in the agriculture sectors, they have reasonable reasonable access to stable financing and the credit. And because today, and we all know that the SME in China is under pressure, okay? They, they had a hard time to get uh, cheap uh, financing, okay? As opposed to the big giants. And this will fundamentally limit if they do not have reasonable capital or capital access. And their, their productivity and also their business activity will be uh, will be confined, okay, and the the ceiling is pretty low, and this will in turn uh, in turn will backfire and affect the supply side. If the supply side supply side is not going to uh, keep pace with the demand side, the consumption the consumption actually will slow down. And we all know that this is like the interactive. Uh, it's it's an interaction, okay, between A and B, okay, force and anti-force, okay. On the other hand, and as a fintech offers easy access to financing to many consumers on the bankers, and the consumption suddenly pick up, accelerates, and also there's a, a side effect, adverse effect, which we haven't observed yet, but theoretically it will happen: the debt to income ratio. And we all know that the credit card, uh, credit card debt, okay, in a in a Western country, sometimes is a is a is a heavy burden, okay, to the young generations, because uh, they got so much, they accumulate a lot of credit uh, credit card debt. And today we haven't seen this yet in China, fortunately, because the the, the credit limit or the uh, the credit limit is pretty conservative. But again, so somebody has to look into that. And they, in, order, in order to make sure the consumption, in order to reasonable consumption rather than over consumption, okay, excessive consumption will drag along the productivity and the gap between the productivity, in particular the SME part and the consumer part, the gap will be wider. And once it's crossed the threshold, and it might give, uh, give us a structure shrinking, okay, they have to reconvert to a reasonable level. And if that happens, and we see that somebody will declare bankruptcy, like uh, in the in Western countries because they couldn't pay for that, or some SMEs, they couldn't sustain this fast growth because they do not have the capital or capital resource. So anyway, so I believe the SME as a foundation of the system has to, has to have reasonable access to the capital. This is a critical question now. 
Yeah, providing these small and medium-sized enterprise with access to capital so that they can be established and can grow, can hire people, can offer new products and services, that's clearly all important. And facilitating consumption as an engine here in the United States, you know, of course, 70, 80% of the economy is driven by consumption. We, in fact, have heard that household debt in China has risen quite a lot. Uh, and much of this, of course, is tied to proper, you know, expensive property and that sort of thing. And we have heard about young people, millennials, who have gotten quite into debt. And so maybe you could say something about the role of the artificial intelligence in evaluating people as credit risks. Now, that is a very specific kind of question, but technology is married to the data in evaluating someone's capacity to pay back loans. Yeah, uh, maybe I take uh, I take the first uh, so to address this question. So, Kalei mentioned a very important facts in China: the young generation they spend so much money. Disposable income is very little now because they spend too much money on the apartments, their households, okay, to buy to buy apartments or the single family house or townhouse in China, okay, and the housing price is skyrocketing, and this becomes a uh, becomes a, an issue to many, including the high tech sectors, uh, young generation, uh, the engineers and the data scientists, and they had a hard time. To get a reasonable size of apartment in big cities, so this in turn again give an opportunity for the AI for the big data parts, okay, cloud computing part to help the lender for the mortgage assessors, okay, to reasonably access uh, to uh, access the data and assess the affordability of these borrowers, and in the past. For example, you only look at your bank, the banking accounts balance, and also your your monthly payment, the salary statements. Okay, but today now, because the young generation, they are pretty, they, they are pretty sophisticated with their personal wealth management. They had a stock, they had a securities, and some even play the future, uh, the 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 the. the uh, the bitcoins, okay. Anyway, so now with all different type of financial assets in place, and how are you going to reconcile and massage all this information together and come up with a valuation model? And this would give us another um, opportunity to leverage on the AI part. Why? Because with so much data, so heterogeneous, heterogeneous data source, and in real time updating, refreshing, and you need AI, you need the cloud in order to do a real time processing and understanding the status and the threshold and also the criticality of a potential borrowers financial status. So rather than just rely on paperwork and do a post event analysis and very often it's just uh, behind the schedule and also um, it's not fair, it's not going to keep up with the latest development of the person's financial status. So that's a part that I see that the lenders, the mortgage borrowers, uh, lend, mortgage lenders actually they are aggressively, aggressively apply utilizing the latest technology to do a better assessment. Okay, and also from another perspective, because they know the social network of these people. Of these potential borrowers, they can leverage on the social, the social network inference to understand to which class these potential borrowers is really associated uh, associated with, and this also indirectly give give them inference on the like uh, the likelihoods of this person is going to default because in the Chinese old sayings we all often we say that similar people come together always go together, so if the group he associated with. It's pretty, uh, the credit score is pretty high. It's pretty uh, credible, okay, with high credibility and also affordability and a pretty good income level. And most likely this person is also good, okay. So we see this is a, this is a, this is a issue this is for the new generation, but the technology will help them 
to do a better assessment and also for self-assessment and how much your apartment can you afford and don't pay too much okay don't buy a big buy bigger and beyond your capability so essentially the technology will play good for both sides the borrowers and also the lenders thank you for that i in before sarah jumps in i wanted to thank you for talking about how it can help the consumer to realize look you don't have the income for this uh, you are not going to be able to pay this back. And even if they give you the money, it's going to be a problem for you later, right? Yes. That sort of education. And so that's one of my questions for Sarah. But I wanted to pick up on one of the things that you just made reference to, and that is tapping into one's social network. Uh, if, if, you know, this is Tencent, they know everybody I know. And uh, I don't want to, first of all, the, what the example I'm about to give is completely fictional. So my friends out there, I'm not talking about you. But most of my friends, they're incredibly reliable people. You lend them money, they pay it back. They're hardworking, they're moving up in their careers, that sort of thing. But what if all of my friends are deadbeats, uh, irresponsible, unable to pay, unwilling to pay, uh, but I'm not. Am I being fairly judged by the company I keep? That's for both of you. Well, I would just say, and I also want to answer the um, earlier question. Um, I think that I, I've actually heard of um, companies in China looking at people's GPS and looking at who they're associated with. Like, are you in this apartment complex? Because we know there are a lot of deadbeats there, <laughs> um, which is interesting. But it's really these uh, risk scoring models that have separated the wheat from the chaff in China and figuring out which companies are going to survive and which are going to fail. Um, so you can see, I'm not going to go into the details of which peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending platforms are better because um, they've come under strong regulation and many have um, failed because they could not properly control for risk and they could not meet the current regulations. So these are just some um, different uh, P2P platforms and um, talking about how they control risk. They're all using technology, big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, um, and, and so on. They have their own model. Some of them go off a of FICO type of model. Mm -hmm. um, and they look at, you know, creative things because a lot of people simply don't have the credit history in China. Um, and China's trying to address that right now by building up the social credit score. Um, and so this is a difficult thing. So they may look at telephone bill payment history, the friends, as Wanli mentioned, the friends that you keep on social media, the types of messages that you send, and they've gotten really creative, um, but to a large extent, relatively accurate about the credit risk of these individuals. A little bit about social credit because I mentioned it, mm -hmm. um, China is developing this system or has developed a system to determine people's um, credit risk based on all of these different factors. So credit card repayment, loans if they have it, um, you know, social insurance deposits, uh, legal issues, and so on. There is a lot of information going into the system. It's not necessarily something that is a negative to people, as a lot of the, I think, Western media has made it out to be. But for a lot of people, they really need this type of credit history in order to get a loan. Um, and so this has been a critical part of providing loans to the small and medium-sized enterprises and individuals. Now, th that's, that's terrific. And it is really interesting to see how this works. Now, one of the questions uh, that Wan Lee mentioned is the question of data security. And one of the things, uh, Sarah, that you've just brought up is the question of transparency. On what basis am I being judged, right? Uh, you, know, you know, we have in the US these three major credit card companies, one of which uh, was hacked, and so people's credit, uh, credit history was, was taken uh, by others. And so you have this question of data security. Uh, is who, who owns this data, uh, who can sell it, 
how it, who it can be sold to, you know, all of these kinds of questions come up. And then the question of transparency. Now, for the most part, uh, a lot of this has been unregulated or loosely regulated. And so maybe the two of you could say something about those aspects of this. Maybe Sarah first. <laughs> Well, um, so in my book, I have a long list of regulations, and I have some of them here. Um, what happens in China is that uh, first, China allows a lot of um, industries to grow before they implement uh, regulation. And so you can see here, like these are a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, regulations. And so there are a lot. There are also regulations in terms of uh, maintaining data security and things like that. Um, here are some consumer lending regulations. So what happens is that an industry crops up, there's innovation, and um, the government lets it run for a while until they see some negative aspects growing, and then they implement uh, regulations. And so this does lead to some negative effects in some cases, there's not necessarily data protections or other types of, um, you know, regulatory control that, you know, should be there. But I think well, that a lot of this it, is changing. if I could interrupt for just a second, in some of the peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, lending and some of those things, people lost money in some of these scandals, right? And so it, it isn't just a reputational question, it isn't just a theoretical question. Some of these people could ill afford such losses. But maybe you could, I, I, again, I apologize for the intrusion. Uh, and that wasn't a data breach, and that wasn't a transparency question, but that had to do with the regulation side of things. Right, so, um, yeah, so <laughs> this does, I mean, these are kind of like two, um, separate questions, I guess, <laughs> um, but you're exactly right, Clay. So you're talking about the peer-to-peer -peer lending protests that happened because there wasn't regulation to start with, um, because there were some firms that were not following best practices, um, you know, there wasn't even regulation in place for some of these, and there was not the technology in place either. I mean, China's fintech industry has changed by leaps and bounds since this time, just in the past few years. And so the whole environment is different. If you wanna compete, you have to be more secure and you have to be more concerned about regulation. But certainly, you know, we wanna avoid these situations of protest <laughs> and things of that nature. Yeah, uh, th thank you. I, I took you off track a little bit, okay. but uh, uh, to come back to this, this security and transparency uh, regulation and, and this sort of thing. And these, of course, are not issues just in China. These are giant issues in the United States and elsewhere. Yeah, actually, Clay, yeah, exactly right. I, I, I think every, uh, so we all remember in the U.S., when you buy a car or you do a mortgage, they will, they will pull your credit score, the FICO score. So if your score is very good, you get very good rates, right, interest rates. Right. And in that particular in that particular scenario, we see that the credit score itself becomes an information, become information to be shared across the different parties to facilitate the consumers. Okay. Well, but and however, that score has value. Yeah, yeah, and this score has value. that score into lower yes. rates. Yes, yes, yes. That has a big value to the consumers, right? With a good credit score, and categorically, that score. It's not the original data. Why? Because nobody, the credit bureau, they very often they are not going to share the original raw data, how they come up with the credit score, the FICO score. They are not going to tell you the raw data. They just tell uh, share this FICO score itself. So this essentially gives us a very good um, hint or as an example to, sh to see how do we go, how are we going to do the information sharing with valuable insights across different industry and meanwhile still preserve preserve the data security and also the privacy per se okay so essentially say that we are not sharing i my in my view we should not sharing the raw material 
rather we share some insightful, actionable insights with value direct business association with the applications. In this case, it's a FICO score. Mm -hmm. And likewise, for example, in China, many P2P, the P2P compliance, as Sarah uh, mentioned, so they failed to do this. Why? Because the platform, they attracted a lot of people to put money into the platform, but the platform does not, does not have enough data to characterize, to characterize the, net, uh, the borrower's risk profile. They only had some collateral, de collateral approach, okay, in order, to, in order to mitigate the risk, rather than leverage on the data tag, uh, I mean the data tag, to have a reasonable assessment on the potential borrowers. So it really becomes just like a broker, the brokerage without any risk assurance. So that basically the bumpy explains the bumpy right in the past uh, couple of years with the P2P industry in China, okay? So again, this tells us that transparency is important because the P2P platform should theoretically should be open about how they assess the credit score or the credit limit of the potential borrowers. But in the past, it was a myth. It was a mystery. And nobody knows it's black box. You just apply and then you get answer and no explanation why you get this, uh, this, uh, this credit limit or why you get denied of that um, and how you are going to improve your credit score or improve your credit limit and no answer with that. So essentially, it becomes a transactional process rather than, uh, rather than pra from practitioner's perspective, rather than risk, risk control or risk averse process. So I feel like the transparency and the security is important across the globe, but there's a solution to that with the technology in place, with the right regulation in place, we can still avoid the adverse impact and meanwhile do the same, do the good to majority of the consumers. Now, thank, thank you for that. And uh, we have, I have another dozen or more questions, but it's time for us to turn to the questions that have come in from people who are uh, watching the webinar, who are participating that way. And a couple of them focus on international kinds of dimensions uh, to this. Now, uh, there was some mention of that made during your presentations about opening up uh, China's financial system reforms and the ability to participate. Uh, of course, China has been part of this global financial system now for some time, and Ant Group is preparing an IPO that promises to be the largest ever, right? Uh, and you have international participation on that. Goldman Sachs and other global firms are participating in that. Now, one of the questions comes from uh, a former gov U.S. government official uh, who, while based in Guangzhou as, you know, serving there, uh, he visited this Foshan uh, Nanhai Financial High Tech Zone. And they talked about all kinds of things that they would do that would be a back office for Hong Kong companies, that Hong Kong firms would be able to draw upon their services. And so his question revolves around the question of that data security, uh, these sorts of things, and, and who has access to that? And whether or not Hong Kong firms will be able to do that and, you know, by implication, do the changes in uh, law regarding Hong Kong, do, does that somehow affect these prospects? So that's the first international question. The second international question was a simpler one, focusing on the ability of companies outside of China to join this fintech revolution. Of course, a lot of American companies and other foreign companies, uh, they're already collecting money via, via we, WeChat Pay and via Alipay from their Chinese customers and things like that. But are there other ways? And again, sorry for throwing two big questions uh, to you both, go ahead and try your best. <laughs> and Sarah, I think it's going to you first. Okay. Um, so first, just a bit about, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, just talk about that really quickly. 
Um, so first, Clay, you mentioned that um, Ant Financial is, uh, you know, doing an IPO. And um, so that, you know, Ant Financial has a lot of money. Um, and <laughs> it's part of Ant Group. Um, and so they filed for an IPO uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, and, you know, they're raising, potentially raising a lot of money for that. Um, about fintech firms from the West going into China, I think that it is going to be challenging um, under the current climate, but I think that potentially things could change. China is opening up its financial sector. It really is happening. Um, it's been really slow over time, but in the securities industry and other industries, some foreign firms are able to enter China. And um, that's a really good, uh, you know, good opportunity for them. But I think in terms of fintech firms, the private firms, they may be looked at uh, individually, potentially by the government. Um, and it, it's something that we'll have to, to wait to look at. Certainly what's gonna happen in terms of TikTok and WeChat, um, we will have to see what happens with that in the US and see how China responds to that. Um, and in terms of uh, you know, the data protections for um, Hong Kong companies, uh, you know, I, I think that they, something may have changed <laughs> to some extent, but even before um, Hong Kong was always dealing with um, the mainland and there are certain risk involved, I believe, especially because Hong Kong is home to lots of offshore bank accounts. Right. Um, and so, you know, there, there are risk involved, but there's also a lot of potential reward. Um, if they're using China, mainland China as a back office, they may continue to do so. Um, and there may be data implications for that, uh, but I think that they'll have to deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, maybe I, I so I, I guess uh, for, for the Hong Kong, for the questions related to the Foshan and Guangzhou, I guess uh, the question was posted, so he was in Guangzhou 2012, that was eight years ago. And probably a lot of things happened, have changed in eight years. And let me give you uh, my perspective as a consumer, regular consumer with a Hong Kong bank, the service, uh, source service quantity. Uh, three years ago, I tried to open a bank account in Hong Kong. I wouldn't name the specific bank. And they asked me to bring my passport and physically go to fly to Hong Kong and do, to verification of my ID. And later on, I had the e-banking, okay, open. Mm -hmm. And every day, every time when I open the e-banking website, I realize the order you have to read from right to left, rather than because traditionally Chinese people read from left to right. Okay, and I say, okay, this is not the bank I want to associate with, okay, <laughs> because they don't understand their customer. Anyway, so I use this to say that. It's not about using the China as a back office. I think they have to look at their own office in Hong Kong, their business level. So if their service level is not up to the moment, up to the latest level, and they will be out. And if they are out and this question doesn't hold anymore, okay, now assume their service level as LA will become, okay, up to the state. And then the next is that with all this data security, confidentiality, this, uh, the, 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 the security, yeah, yeah, safety, and also safety, un unrestricted access, okay, this question. So I think because the particular situation between the mainland, uh, China, Hong Kong as a special admis administrative region, okay, that's a law with uh, regulations related to that activities. I, I think that in theory, there's a solution to that, there's an answer to that. But in practice, this is more like a, so theoretically by law, that's a, by regulation, the answer is clear. But practically, we have to look at, okay, if, if the service level between Hong Kong and China FinTech is so different, we, which in this case, the FinTech service level in China is far ahead of the Hong Kong, and then who is the back office? We have to fundamentally ask the question. I think we have, so eight years ago, at that time, as Sarah mentioned, it's a pre-stage, okay, <laughs> the FinTech, it's a pre-stage. Now it's legitimatization, legitimate now. Okay, so probably we have to look back office the other way around. 
That is an awesome point. <laughs> no, it's a great it's a great example, and particularly, I don't know the particulars of the uh, difficulty you had with the Hong Kong bank, but it sounds as though part of the issue was, uh, although you're a mainland based customer, uh, the you know they're showing you uh, these this information maybe in uh, fontita in traditional characters and going from right to left or something. Uh, as opposed to you know the norms uh, the norms on the mainland that's that's that question of customer service right knowing your customer and meeting your customers needs uh, now one one and this this may be where we end uh, but one question that uh, came up with Sarah's presentation is she was talking about China uh, you know not being so welcoming of cryptocurrencies uh, and having some issues there, even though you know most of the Bitcoin held in the world is is mined in China, um, but embracing the idea of a digital currency. Now, you know, I'm much older than the two of you, and so I even used foreign exchange certificates in China a long, long time ago. And you know, I still have my renminbi, and so I'm still a second class customer when I go into uh, you know, buy anything because I'm not using, uh, you know, digital payments, but digital currency is different. And so maybe you could say something about why digital currency is so important and why it's initiative. And then separate from that, one of the things that Wan Lee emphasized was the role of blockchain in, uh, in all of these things, but particularly with regard to remittances allowing people to move money from Hong Kong to the Philippines or something like that. And remittances, of course, are a giant business. Western Union, the US-based uh, company that, in fact, Ant wanted to buy, but in the current climate was not allowed to buy, uh, Western Union, its main business is moving money around uh, and, and meeting those kinds of needs. And so helping migrant labor and others meet their needs. So maybe either of you can take whichever part of the questions, uh, whichever one of these questions I'm raising. One is to say something more about blockchain and how important it is to the future of these enterprises. And then also the question about why China is embracing digital currency. So, um, yeah, so China has been relatively against uh, cryptocurrencies um, because they are not associated with a government. And um, they did a study that showed that um, a lot of the activity associated with cryptocurrencies um, was fraudulent. And so this was really problematic, you know, obviously no um, financial authority wants to deal with a lot of fraud and money laundering and things of that nature. Um, and so they shut down the um, cryptocurrency exchanges, they banned initial coin offerings and so on. They even cracked down on Bitcoin mining, um, which people were very upset about. Um, but the digital currency is something that the government believes will be highly su successful because they can follow transactions and they can ensure that transactions do not result in fraud uh, and money laundering. And also, the government is very forward thinking in terms of technologies and understands that some sort of form of digital currency is going to be the wave of the future. And so in order to compete with potential um, you know, government-less currencies like Bitcoin, China's government decided that they are going to issue a sovereign digital currency and that it could or could not use the blockchain, that um, you know, certain apps that are used with it could be used on the blockchain or off the blockchain. And um, you know, we can talk about that. I think Wanli can talk about that a little bit more in depth. Yeah, I, I guess um, the blockchain is a technology is going to fundamentally re reconstruct, redefine how trust, the, the trust is going to build and going to transfer and inherit it. So in a sense that in the old days, 
uh, when we apply for a loan, we show our credit score, okay, and the FICO score to Citibank, okay. And today, now with this um, blockchain available, and essentially, we have a distributed way of doing this community-based, uh, community okay, distributed manner to do the, uh, the, the, the sanity check. I, I use the word sanity check, okay, in order to verify the, tr the, tr tr the truth, okay, integrity, for example, the, the content integrity, and also to verify whether this is a true transaction or false uh, transaction, okay. So now, this go beyond the financial transactions, in fact, and we all know that for the food securities, if you want to trace back each particular yogurt or right. milk, right. all this production value chain, okay? So essentially, we leverage on the blockchain technology and coupled with the value chain, with the business process flow and the data flow together, it's going to create completely traceable, accountable, accountable supply chain from the raw milk to the yogurt or to a pizza, uh, to a cheesecake, to a cheesecake, for example. So this kind of a tr trust will fundamentally boost the consumption confidence, the consumer's confidence, okay, when they are doing their uh, shopping, okay, they cannot decide whether this is a true organic, uh, organic, organic green product or not, or this is a fake product, or a knockoff, or is it authentic? So the blockchain service will help us. So essentially, at the end of the day, the whole society needs a credit. And everyone as a part of the society needs a credit. With the association of a group of the society, we need to show we are a uh, trustworthy person, okay? So uh, essentially, I believe starting from financial services, the FinTech with the blockchain, but quickly it's going to go beyond go beyond fintech and go to the even in the production the manufacturing the distribution channel and us from the suppliers to the de to the demand okay blockchain everywhere <laughs> blockchain for today and tomorrow yes. and yes maybe maybe it starts out with uh, the fi fintech and remittances and that kind of thing but we see walmart has gone in big on blockchain for its suppliers. And we see some of the, in the United States, some of the uh, grocery retailers are trying to do that with regard to produce, uh, to try to be able to trace back uh, when they run into E. coli or other uh, contamination problems. Where did that happen? Who, which, which field produced that lettuce, that sort of thing? So blockchain looms very large globally. And you've given us such wonderful examples. I, I teased you with the idea of already asking the last question, but I do have just one more, just one more. And that's, does this travel? And to what extent, for example, is China's fintech explosion? How is this reaching the United States, reaching Southeast Asia, reaching Central Asia? Uh, is this one of the things that China is going to be exporting next. I, um, <laughs> I, um, I would just say that China is exporting it. Um, China's largest uh, fintech companies are partnering with foreign companies, um, especially in Southeast Asia for payments. I mean, that is widespread in Southeast Asia right now. Um, China also is helping to um, determine uh, credit uh, worthiness in other countries, like in developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and providing other means of um, payment and um, savings and loans through things like mobile operators and coming up with all sorts of innovations. And so a lot of FinTech firms in China are already on it and have been for several years. Um, yeah. And so helping a lot of companies, um, a lot of countries to overcome this gap. Yeah, there are places in Los Angeles where you can use WeChat Pay, Alipay to buy tickets and take care of business. Wanli? So, Kalei, I, I actually want to add on, uh, rather than using the words of uh, export, I would say replicates. What mm -hmm. do I mean by that? So, essentially, say, 
that's in the export we all understand that WeChat Pay, Alipay, you can use that from Los Angeles, California, right? Okay. On the other hand, there's another aspect. The success of Alipay and WeChat and how they leverage on the data and to build the credit profile, to build the credit score. And despite that they start from scratch and quickly they finish that, okay? And this success recipe can be replicated with Southeast Asia, like the ASEAN region, okay? Southeast Asia, Indonesia, or Malaysia, okay? They, have, they had a similar, very similar situation as China like 20 years ago with almost zero credit card, right? Not, not, social, uh, not credit uh, system yet. Okay, but if they leverage on the same recipe, okay, with the data technology, the, 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 the mobile app one, and also the ecosystem of local native e-commerce platform in combination, and they will be able to replicate the success of WeChat Pay and also the Alipay. Thank you both. This has been terrific.